All right. All right. Good to see everyone uh, who's uh, held out to the end here. Um, and just to make this uh, worth it, you're going to see that the funnest time that you're going to have is going to be with this last session. Um, either because it's going to transmit all kinds of new knowledge that you're going to be able to bask in, or we're going to have some demos and they're not going to work. And then you're going to be able to have, to have fun <laughs> laughing at that. And so either way, right, um, uh, it's going to be a fun time. We're going to progress with um, trying to lay out where we can go in the development of I2B2 and the concept of embodying the uh, patient um, with a digital twin representation that really means something in terms of calling in a new era of being able to take care of patients through their digital twins. Now, the way that we've been starting is essentially using the digital twin kind of as a repository for all the data, all the digital data that we can collect on a person and putting it together into a truthful representation of that uh, person. And what we've learned during this conference is that um, although it would be nice to just be able to take the data at face value and use that to represent the patient, the reality is that uh, we can't do that because a lot of the data uh, is collected for purposes essentially that preclude it actually having a true representation of, of the patient. And, um, you know, I quote uh, the case where when we collect the status of a patient's uh, uh, diabetes uh, and put it into our uh, uh, government medical services catalogs, it gets collected um, when you get a test for diabetes. And that's because we have to give a person a diagnosis of diabetes when we test them for diabetes. So obviously, if we're testing them for diabetes, we don't know if they have diabetes or not. And many times, they don't have diabetes. But the diabetes diagnosis ends up in their record forever. And that's what people use to do thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of analysis uh, using CMS data. Um, and unfortunately, it's not limited to diabetes. It's limited to many. It, it's, it's present almost across the board. So. Um, you might have a 50% chance of having diabetes when you have the diagnosis of diabetes, but you have a 40% of chance of having rheumatoid arthritis when you have a rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis. All right. So much of what we do is we look for data in other places that gives us clues as to are we going to be able to come up with a truthful representation of a patient based upon electronic real-world data. And we hope to be able to answer this question in the affirmative. And we're going to do this by getting data from many different sources. And it's tools like I2B2 that allow data from many different sources to be integrated and interoperable. And that's the key to how I2B2 can be actually the uh, uh, most important component in many ways of achieving this space of integrating all these different kinds of data on a patient together into a model which is able to carry in a very unbiased way all the different kinds of data. It doesn't matter, right, if it's, you know, been sanctioned as a structured data piece with a special ontology that's, you know, got blessed. It will take all the data and it will affirm it so that we can put all different kinds of things that come together from all different studies, from all different kinds of surveys and so forth, 
um, as well as data that's routinely collected in the EHR in order to make a truthful representation of the patient. So a lot of it we kind of always put together in this kind of diagram where, you know, we've got data coming from the left. It's going into creating the harmonized engine in the middle, which is our uh, digital twin. And then we use this repeatedly for analyses as we get that harmonized data out of I2B2 and are able to then conduct true scientific analyses where we can discover new genes, we can discover new imaging findings, we can find new ways to predict what's going to happen as cancer mutates, um, and new ways to conduct clinical trials where we can herd now the genes that are created in the tumors by understanding what they are and integrating them with new kinds of therapy, which keeps our uh, cancer mutations at bay, right, by understanding them and then be able to knock them all, all at once, known as an evolutionary clinical trial. So this kind of uh, uh, work takes a few things. Uh, it takes the ability to get many different kinds of data using many kinds of ETL processes with many based on different kinds of ontologies, often, you know, one-off ontologies, into um, this harmonized engine. And for that, we've looked at um, how we can do this in a technique that, you know, actually uh, we saw many uh, years ago uh, developed in, in the UK for I2B2 called brisket. It was a, uh, it could take any table, any uh, comma separated value data set, and uh, one row per patient and as many columns as you want and import that into I2B2, transforming it into something that you could then query using all the I2B2 uh, analytic tools. The problem was that uh, once you got a little bit out of the box of what it expected, it would break. And it would break to the extent that uh, it just couldn't be maintained. And like many tools in I2B2 that have tried to do similar things, little tweaks in the way that the data changed and uh, you know, new little things were added to it and so forth, because of course that data wasn't built for I2B2, it was built for whatever its purpose was and you were just trying to put it all together in I2B2, those little things would break these complicated uh, uh, import kinds of tools, and at the end of the day, it was impossible to maintain them. And so we have many of these in the community.i2b2.org uh, site, but they were really, uh, they're not that valuable because they need to be constantly kind of um, uh, enhanced or constantly uh, attended to when uh, you know they're they're taken out a year after they were created and things have changed. Large language models can do two things: they can adapt to actually create ontologies out of resources that are changing, but the LLMs can adapt and change with them and make decisions about how they have changed and how they need to change again in order to make them into something that can be imported into I2B2. And the same goes for the data. We can have programs that are created such that data can be made um, to be imported through these programs into I2B2, um, all created with large language models. Um, and as you can see, uh, Dr. Klan's been working on that. And then there's new query methods that we're looking at that can make it so you know, even though um, we've done a lot of work to get the I2B2 tools to be as accurate as possible, there's so many things, so many features that we would need to add, right, if we wanted to make them really attain their goal, which is to allow anybody, not even just clinicians, not, you know, I mean, we're talking about like people, just regular old people, to be able to go in and actually do an I2B2 query. Is that ever going to be possible? And I would, I would say, built on the work that you're going to see that Mike Mendes is doing, yes, yes, I think we will be able to achieve that. And the eternal problem of maintaining all of our different code sets, 
which you're going to see how Victor Castro has been working on solving that problem with large language models so they can select uh, new kinds of ways that things are being named without um, you know, coming up with a very, very complicated interface uh, that often we have seen in these situations. And then we've looked at how other methods to attain AI-based quality can it be achieved to complement the uh, computed phenotypes that we generate, right, and check them, um, and work hand in hand with these high-performance computed phenotypes, surveying millions and millions of people having billions of facts, recordings about their diseases, because they can take a sample of that and perform a gold standard survey that you see here, right? which is in the red lines, you can see the positive predictive value of the performance of this large language model looking over cardiovascular uh, disease from the notes of the patients actually perform better than humans, clinicians doing the same. So if we can automate that, we can automate the validation, which we often need, of our computed phenotypes in order to do hand-in-hand, -hand, extremely high-performance calculations very quickly, very often, and validated with uh, large language model uh, uh, types of algorithms like you can see here. Now, the problem with this vision is that you've got a lot of things being asked of a large language model. Right, And uh, I don't know about you all, but I've seen them mostly being used as toys. I have not seen them being used seriously. And why is that? Well, because you know you kind of have to ask it something, and then you kind of get an answer back, which kind of makes sense sometimes, but not always. And you have to then recraft your question, and then you get a totally different answer back. And I mean, that doesn't sound very scientific. That sounds like kind of something you would converse with, you know, your dad, you know, when he was like, you know, fishing, right? Gives you different answers depending on the way you ask the question. So that, um, but that power that we've now harnessed by creating large language models needs to be utilized. And we intend to utilize it here in I2B2. And the way that we are looking to do this is with what we call agentic large language model use. And it takes a little while to kind of think about this in a way that makes sense, I have to say, because uh, the first thing I'll say is, you know, okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna be able to manage a process. So you're gonna, agents manage processes. And it's kind of like, you know, you get, a, um, you get a program and it gets the data. And then you get another program and that's an, that you call that next program an agent and it transforms the data to something else. Then you get another program, you transform it, it, can, it puts it into a database. You've all written those programs. That's called ETL, right? Extract, transform, and load. And SSIS basically is connecting a bunch of agents if you want to think of it that way. So what's new here, right? Well, the first, that's called process automation. But what I'm talking about is something that can like take your data and then another process looks at it and says, you know what, that's not what I saw the last time. We need to change this up because I know that we want to make it look like X. So let's try this. And then it does try it. And it's like, you know what, that didn't work. <laughs> It was too slow, or you know, it had a bunch of values that we didn't expect, so let's try a different program. All right, let's write that and do it again. All right, well, now it kind of worked. Now let's try to import it. Well, that program doesn't work to import because it has the wrong values. You know, it, it, made, it did too much rounding of the values. Now let's try it again from the beginning. <laughs> Those are agents working together. Those are agents working together. And the difference, right, is that they're flexible. 
The difference is that they're flexible. They can do the task in a flexible manner. That's what people do, right? That's why people are so valuable, because we can do things in a flexible way. And we don't break. I mean, we break for a little bit sometimes, but not for long, right? So from a large language model point of view, we can think of this as a non-agentic workflow. You're like, well, why don't you just say that all to the large language model to do it that way and just let it do it? Well, it just can't, right? They're just not to that technological level where you can say it in, a, in, a, in kind of a single sentence and then it'll do multi-step process like we just described doing that ETL. But instead, it's just like a person, right? You give a person a task, and it's like, you're like, I can't get this done. But if you give a team a task, it's different. Because different people on the team, one can actually get the data out, one knows SQL and can make the database actually hum along. Uh, another can manage the people, because that's often like the biggest and hardest job, right? Is to try to coordinate everything. Um, and so with an agentic workflow, you break a task down into components that different large language models or different tools that the large language models can call up can do. And it's been shown, and I have to say, this is not, I do not think this is a true scientific or, or, or medical informatics quality study. There are medical informatics quality studies being done, but this is probably not one of them. This was a study that was done comparing uh, GPT-4 being used in a zero-shot way, like we just saw on the last slide, and with an, a system of agents. It's still, you were using GPT-4. Don't, don't get me wrong. They were, still, they didn't, they were using GPT-4, but they are using it in an agentic fashion, like I described. And you can see that the performance uh, was much better but on a task, which I have to say, it's a little bit slanted towards, you know, an agentic approach, which is, you know, uh, given a non-empty list of integers, return the sum of all even positioned elements, right? So it had to kind of count through the elements and take each even positioned element and bring that back. So agents did that in a, in a, in a, in a way that was much, because they can put things in a table and then they can just write a program, and then just pull them out. All right. So what are we really talking about? So AI agents are at the core of what we call an agentic workflow process. Each of them has its own personality role and function. They're trained and equipped with specific attributes and tools that make them highly capable of carrying out intended tasks. They have access to these tools and resources to be able to enhance their capabilities and be able to perform tasks more efficiently. The tools and resources help the AI agents to gather information, analyze the data, and act. And they can integrate, or one can integrate tools like web search, image generation, code execution, and many other things in this manner. The language of the agent becomes the prompt. So unlike, you know, everything that most of us have been doing for the past 20, 30 years in my case, um, is uh, programming, right? That's what we do. But now there's a new thing, a new person in town. It is uh, the English language, and that's what's being used to drive these uh, agents. And um, it uses things like chain of thought, right? and self-reflection. So it breaks tasks down, and it asks you know, whether the answer that it gave before is actually the correct answer. So it's kind of like it's pitting against it, 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 it itself and asking itself questions along the way. Now, I just have to bring this up. So um, for everybody sitting in this room, when you're like, you know, trying to get to sleep at night, do you do that in your head? Ask yourself a question and then answer it, and then reflect on the on the answer that you just gave, and then come back with you know an assessment of whether it was a dumb thing for you to do or dumb, and, and so forth. No, yeah. 
I have to tell you, that's me. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, so this, this idea that you can, that things can talk to each other, even though it's kind of the same brain, so to speak, and carry out a process, I don't think is that unfamiliar. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right, that it seems to reproduce itself in this stuff, right, that we've created um, with a bunch of, you know, silicone diodes. But nonetheless, I mean, it's not that, that foreign. Um, can analyze the task at hand, decide on the sequence of tasks to be taken. Uh, they can adjust the plans when they face challenges. Uh, Self-reflection is when they can gain the capability to introspect and critique their own work. They can analyze the output, review the, and identify areas of improvement, right? I certainly do a lot of that. <laughs> and self-reflection ensures there's a scope of improvements and iterations during the process of task execution. Um, and that's kind of what the prompt adds to the value of the agent. Now, so there's these four agentic reasoning design patterns that I think we always have to keep in mind when we think about agents. So the first is reflection. Um, AI systems uh, with self-feedback and iterative refinement. Um, it doesn't only apply to things like programming, it applies to other kinds of tasks like writing and design and drawing. And it makes it more adaptive and flexible um, so that it can adapt well to real world needs, just like us. And then use tools. I keep thinking about that uh, movie uh, 2001, right, when the uh, there's a bunch of monkeys and they can't seem to get it together uh, and there's like a nice fat pig like sitting like right next to it but they can't see, figure out what to do and the pig just eats all their food and then they pick up a tool which is this old dry bone and they are able to hit the pig on the head and eat the flesh of the pig right and there they have solved their problem and now uh, they can develop um, and, and I should say, um, humans have huge energy needs. Our brains consume enormous amount of energy. In fact, that's why most animals can't develop big brains, because they can't eat enough. We're the only ones that can eat enough to support our, our, our the enormous amount of fuel that our, that our brain needs. Um, so it's a big deal to be able to actually keep this whole thing going by being able to produce enough food or get enough food in order to um, make a, uh, a fuel a brain like ours. Um, so, and let me say, so for um, one of the reasons probably that nothing like a large language model has ever developed in nature is because to train a large language model like GPT 3.5, forget four, does anybody know how much electricity it took in dollars? Not three billion. GPT 4 probably took three billion. GPT 3.5, 100 million. 100 million in electricity. GPT 4 is pretty much a 10x, so I'd say three billion is probably much, pretty, much pretty close, but I don't know that, and nobody knows that, because it's a secret. But for 3.5, 100 million. So you need a lot of energy, right? So you could say, with that kind of energy need for a large language model, it's not an efficient way to go in a, in a world like ours, right? Our brain is the efficient way to go in a world like ours, for now, right? Until Apple, you know, condenses it to it. Um, and... Uh, so, so tools and being able to enhance its, its, your capabilities with tools, and we'll look at this a little more, is really what large language models lack and what I was talking with Zach about already when, when I was feeling sorry for large language, mo language models because they're trapped, right? They're, they're, they're trapped in this virtual space, which all they need is like a hand, right? A, 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 a robotic arm to get out of it or, you know, something to search the web or a calculator even or, you know, some, some, some cameras all over the place or something like that, right? Need some tools. So agents are capable of using tools. And then they're capable of planning. So they can de decompose complex tasks 
um, develop action plans um, and coordinate the necessary substeps and uh, tools. And then finally, um, involve multi-language uh, collaboration or multi-agent collaboration with multiple language models. So, you know, we talked about that other slide where everything kind of used, G all the agents use GPT-4, they're just prompted differently and in interacting with each other, kind of like your own brain would. But you can also create fine-tuned large language models which run different agents. And they'll then be truly capable, right, or truly have a different mindset from each other. So it's not just the prompting that's making a difference. It's the fact that they're actually trained differently, just like us, so we can interact just like doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists do. All right. So planning and self-reflection, uh, breaking down complex tasks, determining sequence of tasks, adjusting the task plan when faced with difficulties, and self-reflecting to identify areas of improvement. We're gonna look at some agents, and they're actually gonna do a toy task. Uh, so I thought about, and I, and I actually started to try to make a more general thing, but it, I knew it was gonna fail. So what I did instead was, uh, and I'll show you all what I did. I, I didn't create like a, uh, um, a way that you didn't have to go into the actual Python program and put the prompt into the agent, and I'll show you what I mean. Uh, it can't, well, I'll show you a nice UI where you can look at all the output of the agent, and I'm gonna type in something that's the topic that the agent's gonna look for, it, but it's fake, and I'll show you what the actual prompts are. And they're this, and this is why, this is what I'm talking about this like. So the, the agent needs to know what its expected output is, what tools it has available, what's the context of the task, and what its goals are. And then the um, uh, role that it has and what we call the backstory. And it will be able to use these tools that come with the system. So it can search documents, CSV files, uh, read, read directories, uh, traverse directories, uh, look through JSON files, look through PDFs, uh, search through uh, Postgres, um, use RAG, um, scrape uh, websites, uh, look through XML, look through YouTube, um, obviously, the limit is only what a person goes in and writes a uh, extension for. Because the way that these tools are going to be utilized is you're going to write a one-liner which says, you know, this tool is to search the internet. And the large language model will understand that line, that English line, and then know to use that tool when it needs to search the internet and then it will be able to launch it and get the output. All right, so at this point, a lot of times people are like, this guy's nuts. So. Let's bring up VS Code. I need my glasses now. And uh, I'm gonna start with, um, the tasks. So the tasks are going to employ an agent, and we're going to let the tasks know what they want, what we want to do, and what the expected output is. And the task that I'm going to give it is, I don't know if any of you people know, but do you know that Anaconda now costs any uh, company that has more than 100 people, and this includes nonprofit companies, $40,000? Doesn't matter if one person in the whole company is using it, the license now says $40,000 for Anaconda. What's that? Doesn't matter. You have to, no, it doesn't, you, you, it doesn't matter if you upgrade or what you do. Yeah, that's what we're like too. Oh shoot is right. We're, we're exactly in the same boat. And, 
You might say, well, that's a horrible thing for them to do. They did it right during COVID, right at the beginning. Nobody noticed because of that until our legal department kind of got a hold of this. Uh, but our uh, studio and Shiny are going down the same path. I don't know the details of that one, I have to tell you. Okay. So in that context, the question is, what do you do? How are we going to adapt? And, you know, I was too lazy to, like, look this up myself. So instead, I thought, well, we'll launch our large language model, and we'll ask it what to do. And so it says, uh, so I said, uh, fetch the top website blurbs that can be used in place of Anaconda and ensure that at least a couple of articles that you've looked at and then format your answer in this kind of markdown way. This is what the, I don't expect, uh, just to be clear, I don't expect anything about the Super Bowl, right? This is just, it's, it's profile of like what the answer is supposed to look like. Just like if you were in class and you were gonna write an essay on, you know, um, the jungles of, uh, of uh, Brazil, and they said, well, it needs to look like this, you know, uh, agriculture report that, you know, was produced on the, you know, uh, on the Yellowstone Park. Make it look in this format, right? So that's what you were telling it with this expected output. And then, switching over to the agents, um, we'll have an editor agent, and we'll say that it wants to, you know, compare open tools and, and look at uh, functionality. We're going to uh, pass by all my uh, error checking code, or, or you know what I mean, and a news fetcher agent, and a news analyzer agent. Uh, again, analyzing you know substitutes for Anaconda, distilling it down with a critical eye, and then compiling at a newsletter compiler. All right, so now we're going to start it and see if it works. Just thinking about working. All right. So it wants a topic, but and this is where I started to make this visual interface that you know we could write all the, the you know you could see how you could kind of make a, a topic and then it could you could ask all those more formulated prompts in each of the different agents to do their specialized tasks. But anyway, didn't didn't get around that. Um, and so, but you would put something like replacements for anaconda in here. It's it's not going to carry this topic through, so it doesn't matter what I put in. But that's that would be the idea. And then it says press the button. So I. Press the button. Okay, so now it's actually going and initializing the different agents. And it's kicking them off. And now they're talking to each other. And they're thinking really hard, I guess. There we go. So one came back, used a tool, said, search the internet, fetch the top website blurs, and said, wait, do I need to do it? <laughs> use a tool? And some kind of error occurred. So you think, well, that's dead in the water, right? But no, no, it's not. See, it says, look, there's a problem. Didn't seem to work. Let's do it again. And this one says, well, let's resort to looking into the JavaScript. This one says, wait, the JavaScript thing didn't work, so let's try something else. Keeps, it's going down the JavaScript path here. It needs to get out of the JavaScript path. So they're kind of talking to each other, saying, well, JavaScript kind of worked, but didn't really. Let's go back to serving, searching the internet. Let's 
It's going down a bad path, let me just tell you. Let's see if it can recover. I'm not sure it can. It, it doesn't seem to be able to get out of this JavaScript problem. It, it seems to know what happened. And now it's trying to figure out like what it needs to do. And it says it failed. All right. Let's try this again. Yes. Oh, let me try it one more time. Let's go back to do this one more time. So you see, this wasn't a canned demo. Like I said, it doesn't matter what I put in the topic. It's set up by the prompt. All right, so it's starting to look at the internet. Not going down the JavaScript path, so that's a good that's a good sign. Let's see if it's oh. doesn't seem to be using its tool properly for some reason. I'm not sure why not. Try one more. You can see it's, it's trying. All right, let's try one more time, and then we'll then we'll uh, then we'll cave. I think one of the issues is so the the actual LLM that I'm using here is Olama and it's actually llama three. And I think, I'm trying to remember what I set the temperature for. Here we go. See, now it's getting stuff. I think I, I can't remember what I sent the temperature for, actually. But the, um, so now it's starting to get stuff off the internet. Like that. There we go. So now see it's good and stuff. Starting to put things together. 
There we are. Getting stuff off the internet. Putting it together. They do take a long time, I have to tell you. So one of the problems which we kind of uh, have with large language models is that, and the reason that they will never kind of be something that we can only use in I2B2 and nothing else is because they take a long time. And so we can use them to check ourselves and to run, little, uh, to run operations like this, to make new programs that can run fast, um, but they're not gonna be able to um, they're not going to be able to substitute for things like the computed phenotypes that we do in a, in a high-performance way. Um, let's switch back here just to see what it's doing. Uh, okay, I see. So it produced its output and it didn't tell us, sorry. Okay, so here's the output. Um, So basically it says, uh, uh, Mamba, an open source package manager, is gaining recognition as a variable alternative to Anaconda. Uh, Mamba is introduced as a fully compatible drop and replacement. Uh, it read a blog post that emphasized the value of open source solutions like Mamba. Um, and, um, and then it says, you know, how could it be problematic? It says that they're similar and that they both have the same license um, and Mamba offers good cross support and uh, users are gonna have to adapt their workflows when switching from Conda to Mamba, or Mamba, sorry. So it says, the five articles demonstrate the growing recognition of Mamba as a viable alternative to Anaconda. Uh, highlighting its features, advantages, and challenges, we can get a better understanding of how this open source package manager can benefit developers and scientists. All right, so that's it. That's, that's your agents going out to the web, uh, kind of knocking off each other, uh, making mistakes, recovering, uh, and then you know, putting together a, a newsletter. Um, All right, so as you can see, you know, we're not just talking about a, a, a type of approach that can be used for, you know, I2B2 in its narrow sense. We can use this thinking in terms of clinical trials, right, and the many different phases and things that clinical trials need to overcome. Um, and agent work uh, using large language models can overcome all of those. And we should just keep in mind the framework for agentic designs, reflection, tool use, multi-agent collaboration, and planning. All right, thank you.